Okay. Ready to start. <clears throat> we are in the final stretch, two more hours. My voice is giving up, but I think it's going to hold. So if we can start. We have two more hours to try to finish the discussion. And I see that many of you have very interesting initiatives, very interesting questions. And um, I cannot answer most of those questions because there is no adaptation expert. I'm not an adaptation expert in the sense that adaptation is very particular for each one of your cases. No? So I'm a, I could be regarded as an expert of adaptation in Guatemala within farmer communities within the areas of Guatemala. Maybe be an expert, but beyond that, no way I can be an expert. So many of your questions I cannot answer, but at least I can give you more questions to think about. But something that I wanted to bring your attention to Again, we, we, I show you the, the site of the IPCC, uh, and I really encourage you to, to go, and if you are interested, <laughs> déjala, déjala, sí. If you are interested, <laughs> if you are interested in reading more about what we have been discussing so far, I mentioned to you that the four topics that we have been discussing follow closely the four chapters on adaptation, chapter 14 through chapter 17 in the IPCC report. So I encourage you to, to open up those chapters and, and, and browse through them, because they might be useful for some of the stuff that you're doing. But more than anything, more than the text that is here, which might be too general for your own problems, uh, I just wanted to draw your attention to the fact that these chapters are very useful to find more literature on different uh, topics. So probably the most useful part of these chapters is at the end, no? When you, when you look at the references. Oftentimes, you see a chapter that might be 10 pages long, but the list of references is so long that it's 20 pages long. And so the list of references in these chapters are very valuable. So I encourage you to open the, the documents and browse through them, and if you find something interesting, here's a, a good way to, to read more about uh, that. No, the, the list of uh, references in each one of the chapters is, is, is basically as good as it gets in terms of, uh, of a literature review on a specific topic. No? And so this specific chapter, you can see how many references you have, so it's, it's a good source of information. So if you want more literature on the topic, that's the first step of looking for that literature, no? Now, this is getting a little bit old already because this is 2014, so three years old. And in three years, there's a lot of li new literature coming up. But at least this is the first step to find information, additional information on the things we've been discussing. I wanted to show you the, the book that we produce on indigenous knowledge, but it's in my, uh, in my computer. So I'm going to try to do it at the end of the, of, of the class to, to put it here on the screen. But if you are interested in that book on indigenous knowledge, we have it in PDF, so I can send it to you uh, if you write to me. My, my email address is, gonna, is uh, in the presentation at the end. So if you, are more, if you want to learn more about indigenous knowledge and on, on the work we've been doing on indigenous knowledge, just send me an email and I can, I can send you that book that we produced some years ago in an attempt to add more of the... Uh, knowledge from indigenous communities into the IPCC reports. Is no, this is this, this was no this was uh, worldwide, ah, worldwide but worldwide but the focus was Latin America. Okay. Ah, <laughs> uh, no the the focus was on Latin America. In one of the workshops we had an indigenous leader from Costa Rica. So there is some some knowledge there from Costa Rica. Uh, but we had also people from, from the Arctic, and uh, yeah, so it's, it's worldwide. Oh, interesting. Uh -huh. Okay. <clears throat> so, let's move on here. Remember, we were talking about constraints to adaptation. So we have a long list, so let's move quickly through the list. The first one was knowledge and awareness. Physical and biological. This is a, a graph that I promised to show to you in the morning when you were asking about migration, no? Well, this is about migration of animals, not people. So this is one of the few graphs in the IPCC report 
that has nothing to do with people but with animals and plants. And this is an interesting graph that is showing <clears throat> two things here. One is the speed of the climate of climate change. How quick how quickly or slowly the temperature is going to change depending on the different scenarios. Okay? So in the more pessimistic scenario, the temperature change uh, changes faster. In the more optimistic scenario, the temperature changes slower. And the bars over here show how quickly species can move to adapt to that change in temperature. So for example, larger mammals can move much faster than smaller animals and much faster than vegetation, no? Trees move very slowly, no? You don't see them walk, but they do walk little by little, no? So every, every day they move one little step because they spread their, their seeds, no? And so their offsprings are going to be one <coughs> step ahead and one step ahead. But they move very slowly. And so what this is showing is how fast species would have to move to adapt to a changing climate under different scenarios. So under the more pessimistic scenario, only some of the species will be able to move that fast. But some other species are going to face a bigger problem because they will not be able to move fast enough to adapt to the change. So this is showing that either species will move or they will have to live adapt to live in a hotter environment if they cannot move, or they will become extinct. Now, those are the three uh, options that species will face. Now, let's say that big mammals manage to move in response to a changing uh, temperature, to an increasing temperature. <clears throat> so the mammals, in theory, can move. In practice, oftentimes, the bigger animals, and all the animals, will need to have a, a suitable ecosystem environment to be able to move. But if that environment is fragmented, they will, of course, find a barrier uh, to moving. And so in that case, there will be a limitation to adaptation because they, there's a, a physical limitation, right? A physical limitation for animals to move because their ecosystem stops at some point when, when uh, the forest, for example, stops. Even worse. Let's say that these animals are trying to move north because it's getting too hot in here or in Central America, no? So they are moving north, and all of a sudden they find a wall that was built to stop humans but can also stop animals, no? And so walls that are built to stop humans will also limit, put a physical limit on uh, migration of animals and therefore on adaptation of animals, no? And so we were talking about constraints. Well, here we're talking about limits. A wall will definitely uh, limit the possibility of mobilization. And if we limit the possibility of mobilization, then we are completely limiting the possibility of adaptation. <clears throat> OK? Um, another type of biological constraints to adaptation has to do with degradation of the environment. We talked a little bit about this in the morning the relationship between uh, uh, deforestation and climate change. No? So uh, deforestation can cause some additional problems that will, that will increase the impact of climate change. We were talking about reduced evapotranspiration in the morning, no? remember? And that increasing the risk of flooding in certain areas that are getting more rainfall. But in general, so land use change is a driver that adds to the problems of environment uh, of climate change. Uh, other types of ecological, uh, ecological degradation, <clears throat> for example, include uh, degradation in aquatic systems. So water pollution is, of course, a problem that can add to the problems of climate change. We have discussed extensively that climate change is basically giving us a problem of too much water at some point or too little water at some uh, other extreme. And so we really need to manage excess or deficit of water. So we really need to learn how to manage our water systems better. But if our water systems are already degraded to begin with, before climate change, if our water systems are polluted because we are dumping our sewage into the, into the natural uh, 
uh, rivers and lakes, like we're doing in Guatemala, for example, then that degradation is already limiting our capacity to manage that system under a new scenario of climate change. So that's a very good example on how environmental degradation is limiting, or at least is constraining, our ability to adapt. Soil degradation also, no? Desertification. Those are problems that, are, uh, that can or cannot be related directly to climate change, but those are problems that definitely increase uh, our constraints in terms of adaptation to climate change. And so it's important to realize that um, climate change is a problem that is coming on top of additional problems that we have, both social and biophysical, no? We are talking about poverty, inequality. Now we are talking about environmental pollution. So all of those were problems and are problems that we had from many years ago. And now what we have on top of that is a changing climate that is making things uh, more complicated or more difficult to adapt to. Uh, other constraints are economic and financial. <clears throat> this is important. Um, money matters. No? Money makes a difference. I always like to, remember, uh, to remind my audiences, in Guatemala we had <clears throat> a uh, marketing um, campaign uh, saying something like, uh, money is not happiness. It's not happiness, but it surely comes very close to it, or it surely looks like it a lot, something like that, said in Spanish, no? El dinero no es la felicidad, pero se le parece mucho, ¿verdad? <laughs> and so money, is, is, it looks a lot like happiness, no? Well, in terms of climate change, that also is true, no? Money might not be the ideal solution, but it does help a lot. So whether you have money or not makes a huge difference if you are living in an area prone to a landslide, if you have the money to build a cement wall, that's going to make all the difference in the world. No? If you don't have that money, then the risk of being buried under, under a landslide, under a mudslide, is much higher. Uh, so definitely, um, <clears throat> money makes a difference. And in terms of uh, economies in developing countries, our economies are oftentimes based on agriculture, forestry, fisheries. So our economies are based on using natural resources, uh, oftentimes. And so those economies, based on the use of natural resources, are oftentimes more vulnerable to changes in the climate. And so in that sense, we also have higher vulnerability to climate change. Uh, we also talk about uh, global markets. No? Uh, again, this is an economic issue. But uh, a fluctuation in prices in the products that I use, whatever they are or what the products I produce, that fluctuation in those markets can increase the vulnerability that I have. Like we were showing in, uh, earlier uh, today, <clears throat> I'm really exposed to a series of uh, risks, not only climate change. And basically, my reaction is to try to minimize uh, the majority of those risks or at least the risk that I perceive to be the, the, the most impacting on me. And so climate change oftentimes goes together with a risk of, for example, a fluctuating market. Uh, lack of access to climate insurance, lack of access to soft loans and tax breaks. That's also very important. If you, if you went through a disaster, if a, if, a, if a hurricane went through my area, it makes a whole world of difference to recover if I'm able to get a loan or some money to recover, that if I don't get that money, no? And that was, um, that was very evident in Guatemala. I was telling you the story that we had all these uh, hurricanes and storms going through the country, uh, space about every four years, no, in the last decade. And four years was not enough for, for, uh, for the communities and for the government to recover the, the impact of the previous hurricane. So, People were trying to recover from the first hurricane when the second hit, and then they were trying to recover from the two of them when the third one hit, and so that, that became a big, big problem. And so part of the situation there was money, money availability. That makes a big difference. And so the, the local money was not enough. It would have been ideal to have outside money come to, to help, international funding for adaptation. But again, access to that uh, funding oftentimes is limited by the same situation that we are facing in terms of um, lack of internal organization. So in general, <clears throat> we see that uh, 
a key word is uh, diversification. You know? If we are more diversified, then uh, we are less prone to being affected by a change. So if I'm a, if I'm a farmer and I only produce one crop and that crop uh, happens to get some disease, then I lose uh, all my assets. But if I have three or four crops, then if I lose one of them, I might have two others that will help me. Of course, if I only have a small plot of land, that, that's very common in Guatemala because the density of population is very high. If my plot is very small, it's very difficult to diversify. So density of population, amount of land availability is also an important factor here for diversification. So if I have <coughs> more different crops that help me, if, if I have more income sources that help me, if I'm a farmer but I'm also a teacher, or to my fa if I'm a farmer but I also work in construction, uh, that also helps me, right? Um, so diversifying, of course, is always important, especially in the face of uh, uh, financial uh, stresses. <coughs> Governance and institutions, this is very important. We also discussed it earlier. Um, if we have a group of people, either a community or a city, no, we were talking about this morning. Is it better to have people group in a city because together they will have more assets, more more resources to confront any stressful situation? Yes, that is true as long as the group of people is well organized, as long as we have good government uh, organizing the people. And so uh, institutions are very important, whether institutions are working to organize people in the right direction. <clears throat> whether institutions are working to access international funding, like we have said repeatedly, no? If, if our institutions are not set up in the, in, the, in the good way to access this funding, it doesn't matter if we have all this money available out there. We won't, we won't be able to, to access it. Corruption is a big problem. Uh, we have discussed this a lot. That's definitely a huge problem in many of our countries. Even if we have the money, uh, the money goes somewhere else or disappears, no? Uh, and that's a problem everywhere in the world, unfortunately. So that's a situation that is difficult to, to deal with. And I guess together with corruption, we can also think about um, other illegal activities, like uh, drug trafficking, for example. You know, drug trafficking can be very problematic in many areas. And, and you will say, well, that's not really related to climate change. It might or it might not be, uh, <clears throat> but it's definitely adding to the problem, no? Again, if, if I'm facing many risks, one of them including drug, deal drug dealers trying to kill me, well, then that's one more thing to worry about together with climate, together with markets, together with health. And so definitely uh, corruption and other illegal activities are things to uh, think about when we talk about uh, adaptation. <coughs> um, and and this, this, uh, these two things we have discussed also in the past, um, the connection at, uh, with different levels of, of, of government and governance, no? uh, national governments, local governments, um, community governance. So those three ideally should be lined up in the same, same direction. In practice, that's often not the case. No? In practice, oftentimes, the national government thinks that we should go this way but the local people say, no, we should go this way. So that's always tricky to do. And in general, <clears throat> we, our own research in Mesoamerica, but I'm sure it's the same case in your countries and your examples, um, if, if we are able to organize local people, if we are able to have a community with more organization, then we have a better chance of uh, helping that community confront uh, climate change. Um, local organizations are key, and oftentimes, uh, unfortunately, local, local organizations are difficult to keep. Our experience, our own experience in, in Mesa America shows that, and, and that's in general uh, human nature, we are very good at grouping and coming together into our organ organization in the face of an extreme event. You know? So if we, see, if we see an extreme weather event like a hurricane, then we group and we try to get organized. If we see a big problem, like for example, the market collapse and the prices are very low, then we are good at getting together in those bad times. 
but when the when the market recovers and the prices go up again, then it's hard for people to remain organized because now they are paying me more money for my product. I don't want to waste time or effort in trying to coordinate with all these people. All these people are a pain because they all want to do their own thing. They are all very crazy all the time, and so why should I worry about coordinating with them? So what we see oftentimes is that when we have a good, uh, when we have the uh, the situation being uh, more favorable, either in, term of, in terms of prices or in terms of climate, then organizations tend to break apart, you know? And, and that, that's, uh, that's uh, unfortunate because if, if we organize only in the face of a problem, the problem is that we take some time and effort to get organized. And oftentimes, uh, it is easier to prevent than to react to a problem. So if we are able to keep our, our organization, even through the good times, we should be able to get organized to prevent any possible impact in the future. But if, we're, if our organization only comes together after something bad happens, then we are only reacting to the problem. And so ideally, we would try to keep local organizations active, not only in the bad times, but more importantly, in the good times. You know? But again, that's uh, tricky. It takes a lot of effort to get organized. And we, we see it at all levels. <clears throat> For example, in, in, in the area where I live in the city, uh, we have a lot of local crime, people break into the houses, and we are trying to get our neighbors organized to try to increase our security. And, and we are all educated people. We are all uh, middle-income uh, people. So you think it would be easier to get them organized. And it's impossible. I mean, nobody wants to attend a meeting. You call a meeting, nobody comes. You ask for any donation, even a very small amount, and nobody wants to donate money, right, for these purposes, even though it's not a donation for, for charity. It's a donation for their own security, but it's difficult. It's difficult to convince people to come together, difficult to convince people to, uh, to give some money, especially give money. You know, when you start talking about giving money, that's when people back up and say, no, 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 no money, you know? So it's complicated, but... Again, adaptation has to do a lot with convincing people that we need to be organized, that we need to put our money into the right places. Social and cultural competing values. <clears throat> we talk a little bit about this in the morning, no? Part of the problem is that too many of us around, no? So we need to control for how many people we are. Now, birth control is extremely complicated to talk about, no? In many, many areas, it's impossible to talk about. Uh, we also discuss ideas that if we see climate change as something that comes from God, then there's nothing we can do about it, no? So that's also a limiting factor, of course. <clears throat> what do we do about it, no? Uh, gender issues, we, we, we discussed this also previously, no? In some areas, women are completely void of many rights. In some uh, areas, for example, women cannot own land, for example. So if you cannot be the owner of a piece of land, how can you use that land to help you adapt? You know? So if you are a woman who is alone, who is not together with a man, then you are in a very complicated situation <clears throat> in terms of uh, trying to adapt to a changing environment. Um, competing values, for example, genetically modified organisms. No? So uh, we, mo we modify this corn to be more resistant to drought. So we have this super corn that resists drought. Or we have this super corn that resists uh, pest infectation. So that seems to be a good thing, no? But many people doubt that that's a good thing. So there, there's competing values. Some people think that's a good thing. Some people think that's a bad thing. And so is that a good solution? Is that a possible solution? Is that an adaptation solution or not? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Just can I go back to the, to the first one, the birth control? Uh -huh. I think that's, I mean, that, we, we shouldn't overlook that, that factor because it, it, it should be really in, in, in something that comes into the future, into the near future. China did that and it worked. And if, imagine how, how how big will be the population without China doing that? Yeah. And now China is relaxing that, and I mean the rest of the world I think has to contribute in a way with that. Yeah. I mean our generation 
I mean, I find immoral some someone of our generation thinking having four children, three children, two children. Mm -hmm. um, so really, it's something that we shouldn't overlook. And, yeah. and I would, I would sort of, even if it sounds complicated, but I, I would, I would sort of um, <laughs> highlight a bit more that is, is, is yeah. our personal contribution <laughs> to to the world. Yeah. Uh, you were saying, imagine what happened if China hadn't done that. Well, you don't have to imagine because you just have to look at India, no? And India is going to surpass China as being the largest country pretty soon. Um, I think this is an issue, when you talk about the word control, it's an issue of human rights. However, there are ways to um, not put a control, but at least have some education, family planning. Uh, there are ways to reduce yeah. population explosion in, yeah. in particularly in poor countries where there these things really don't exist there's no proper education about family planning um i think that there are ways that can be done this can be done without mm -hmm. saying okay you're not allowed to <coughs> exactly yeah it comes to 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 choices no and freedom of uh, choices um research shows that in many countries where population is exploding if you ask women if you had the choice, would you have less children than what you have now? The majority of women say, yes, I will have less children. So many, many, many women didn't have the option of, of uh, birth control, for example. But on the other hand, many women were forced to use birth control in some other places. And, and those are the bad cases that give a bad reputation to birth control. Education, for sure, is the best solution. Now, that's proven also by a lot of research. Education, unfortunately, takes time, no? so education is a solution that will take 20, 30 years. We were talking about that over the break. But 20 to 30 years is the time that we have for climate change to start acting, so it might be in the same time frame. Uh, microphone on that side, thank you. Actually, um, uh, uh, Professor, it's, uh, you have said the point that it's education, uh, but the challenge, actual education is the best, uh, especially where there is, where the population is increasing. Mm -hmm. but, but, but the challenge has been access to this education. Uh, for example, women in the developing countries are still marginalized. And when it comes to education, it's still the, 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 the dropout rate for Mm -hmm. the girl child uh -huh. it is still high statistically it has been shown so if there are efforts of increasing access in the rural developing world access to access to education, uh, to education. yeah accessibility i think it is the common challenge uh -huh. that's how we can overcome uh, the exploding population uh -huh. otherwise um, uh -huh. It's not also uh, immoral, as <laughs> somebody said, mm -hmm. but uh, sometimes it's culture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, yeah. it's attached to culture kind of yeah. tradition. So mm -hmm. the only aspect which can break that, it's just to enlighten people that you see. Yeah. If you produce two children, yeah. they can get quality life. You can yeah. be, You can be able to take yeah. them through good education, something like that. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. you have to yeah. do better for <laughs> education. Okay. That is it. Yeah, two is a magical number, no? So if we get everybody to have two children, then we are fine. Because then the two parents die, but the two children replace the two parents. That's the replacing, that's the replacing uh, fertility, no? That's a, that's a given, that's a fact. Um, the good news is that we are on our way to achieving that, no? So even if we don't do anything, eventually the population is going to stabilize. The bad news is it's going to take about 60 to 80 years, no? So by the end of the century, the population is going to stabilize, but it's going to stabilize to between 10 to 12 billion people, so almost twice as what we have right now. Um, besides uh, education, there are some many countries with this problem with religion issues uh -huh. that they don't um, <coughs> allow birth control, mm -hmm. and then how we deal with this. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. So that's a, that's a big discussion that we don't have time to to go into. But yeah, religion, of course, is is there as as a competing value. Um. <clears throat> so so yeah, all all of these issues are are big issues because they are at the core of our beliefs. You no, know? and changing our beliefs is oftentimes difficult. You no. Know? Changing our behavior is complicated, so changing our beliefs is even sometimes more complicated. Um, okay. So, we, that, uh, that discussion was in terms of constraints to adaptation, so things that make adaptation more difficult. But now let's talk about limits to adaptation. If the constraint becomes too big that we cannot overcome that constraint, then we are talking about a limit, you know? So there are limits to adaptation. There are things that where we, 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 where we, we cannot go beyond that in terms of trying to change our, our surrounding to make it better, you know? A limit is reached when adaptation efforts are unable to provide an acceptable level of security from risk to the existing objectives and values and prevent the loss of key attributes, components, or services of ecosystem. Now, when we talk about adaptation, <clears throat> we can talk about hard limits and soft limits. Uh, basically, what we're talking about here is there are some limits that will not change. There are some limits that are so big that even if we have the best technology, the best knowledge, that's going to be a limit. You know? Big changes in the ecosystem. Um, if we melt all the ice in the two poles, we might have some drastic changes in how the planet works, and that might be uh, catastrophic to many ecosystems. And so that would be big enough that there's no way that we can adapt to that. You know? And so that, that would be a limit to adaptation. There can be also uh, soft limits, uh, changes that are not so drastic, or they are drastic enough right now, but in the future we might have technology to adapt to those changes. So those are... Uh, soft limits in that maybe now there are limits, but maybe in 10 years or in 20 years, with more knowledge, with more technology, we might not have that limitation because we might have more uh, resources to try to confront that limit. In general, we see that the level of adaptation needed depends a lot on the climate that we are facing in the future, right? So if we are facing a more extreme climate, we might need stronger adaptation measures. If we are facing a not so extreme climate, then the adaptation needed is not that uh, high. And so at the end, mitigation is really what is limiting adaptation, right? So if, if we are able to reduce the extreme changes of five degrees, for example, and limit the changes to two degrees, then adaptation might be more feasible. But if we are not able to control for the emissions of greenhouse gases and we reach four or five degrees, then adaptation might have to be so strong that there might be more and more options where we just cannot adapt. So it's always important to think of those two terms, no? We are think thinking about climate change and, and, and climate change is still an uncertain thing depending on what we do in terms of mitigation. <clears throat> this is a table from chapter 16 in the IPCC uh, uh, work. And this is, uh, this is some summary of uh, things that we discussed and that we presented in previous slides. So basically, this is showing different sectors, right? Freshwater, terrestrial, coastal, ocean, food, urban. It's also showing regions, Africa, Europe, Asia, North America. And it's showing opportunities, constraints, and limits. And basically, in a graphical way, it's trying to tell us what we need if we want to increase adaptation, what is limiting adaptation in most places, and, uh, and what is constraining adaptation. Interesting to see, for example, it calls your eye to see that big eye in most places, no? meaning that information is definitely limit adaptation. Very interesting to see that Asia has no eye for some reason. I think it was a mistake, unless uh, our Asian colleagues can tell us that, no, you don't need more information, that you have all the information already. But basically, information is definitely 
uh, a limitation, no? And, and that's where we come into play because we are experts in generating new information. That's what scientists do. So that's where we can help, no? Again, the problem is how to transmit that information to the proper groups of people so that they can use the information. So you can look at that table in more detail and, and study and see if it makes sense or not. But at least that's what the experts in that chapter decided that was important for different sectors and different regions of the world. So <clears throat> we come to the last portion of the presentation, which is not that long, so we might still end ahead of time, which was our goal. But we need to talk a little bit about, about economics, no? about how do we put a value to all of this. And some of you have asked me about that question. No? So my work, some of you have said, is to try to, to value adaptation, no? how to put a number on adaptation, how much is it going to cost. And we, we already discussed it in the morning a little bit. This is tricky because we need to be able to figure out <clears throat> the cost of things, right? Including the cost of a human life, including the cost of uh, different species of animals, including the cost of many other things that sometimes are hard to uh, cost. So just a few thoughts about economics. First of all, why do we need economics into the picture. Why are we in need of an economic analysis when it comes to adaptation? Well, it's very simple, no? The resources are limited. So even if the countries, the rich countries, provide $100 billion per year to um, developing countries, that might not be enough, no? So those, that's still a limiting amount of money. And so if we have a limited amount of resources, economy, can help us in decide where to put that money, where that money can <clears throat> be more effective in producing a better result. In general, um, economists have an extensive experience of applying concepts and methods um, to make uh, to for decision making, and adaptation at the end is all about making decisions, all about how to change our behavior, for example, or how to change our uh, way of organizing. And so in that sense, economics can bring a lot of insight into the picture. Um, <clears throat> one of the limitations, actually, is that not until recently, m the majority of the economists were not very interested in this problem. Uh, in that sense, uh, I was telling you in the morning, uh, this guy, uh, Stern, uh, from the United Kingdom was kind of uh, opening um, uh, a road there, a way, uh, because he was one of the first economists who became very prominent worldwide by talking about climate change. And so he opened the way to other economists to start working in the area. And so, um, <clears throat> in a way, in the last 10 years, we have seen more and more economists uh, interested in this topic, but still probably not enough, no? So we still have a, a, a lack of information in many aspects in terms of how much things cost to make better decisions in terms of adaptation. <clears throat> now, having said that, it's also important to remember that not all adaptation involves investment or is costly, right? <coughs> so not necessarily we need money to do adaptation, no? Uh, sometimes adaptation involves changes in behavior and lifestyle, although that also requires money sometimes, no? We were talking about education being a good way to change uh, lifestyles and behavior, but education takes money sometimes or oftentimes, no? If we want to <clears throat> change the behavior of people, we probably need a campaign. We probably need a massive campaign, and that takes money. But in general, we can think that if I want to make a change of my own behavior, I might not need to invest any money. It's just a decision, you know? So there are some things that, yes, I can do on my own without <coughs> investing any more money. Um, <clears throat> a comprehensive analysis of adaptation would then consist of a multi-metric analysis that includes not only a cost-benefit analysis, but also a non-monetary uh, measure. Okay, so we really need to think about, first of all, doing 
cost benefit. That's the basic analysis that we would need. We would then need to apply other monetary procedures beyond uh, cost benefit, and then we would need to consider non-monetary issues. Remember that not everything <coughs> can be explained or related to money. Now, this is uh, <coughs> an important figure that comes from Chapter 17, which deals with economics of adaptation. And, and, and this figure uh, can give us, uh, in a graphical way, a good understanding of what the situation is. So <coughs> in the outside circle, what we have is what we call the adaptation space. So this is everything that is suggested that we need to do. This outer circle is what we need to do, what we think as scientists that should be done to adapt to climate change. That outside circle gets bigger or gets smaller depending on what? We just said it a few minutes ago. Economics. Depending on? Economics, but more specifically, depending on the development pathway that we see for our future. Depending on the emissions that we see for the future, right? So if we continue with increasing emissions, then we have a bigger problem of climate change, then the adaptation space becomes bigger, meaning we need more adaptation, right? If the climate change in the future is not so drastic because we are able to control our emissions, then the adaptation space becomes smaller, meaning we need less adaptation. So the outer circle is basically what we need based on how big the problem is. And how big the problem is, still variable, still uncertain, depending on our own decision. The next circle <clears throat> talks about what we can do. The next circle then talks about technical and physical limits. Okay? So this is really all that is supposed to be done, but some of this stuff cannot be done because we don't have the technology to do it. Right? And so there are some adaptation that is impossible to do. For example, the chapter gives a very simple example. If it gets hotter, because climate is warming, then it's going to be more unpleasant to be outdoors. Right? So one solution is to be indoors with air conditioning, the way we are right now in here. But we cannot be indoors all the time. Right? So we need to go out often to work or to play or to do whatever. No? So if it is hotter outside, there is no way that we can make the weather pl more pleasant for us because it's just hotter. We cannot put air conditioning outside everywhere, no? We cannot create a bubble where we have air conditioning for individuals walking in the street. And so there's really a physical limitation to some adaptation measures, right? If it is too hot because it's warmer now, then it's going to be more uncomfortable being outdoors, period. There's nothing we can do about it. No? We can be indoors with air conditioning, but if we need to go outside, there's a limit to what we can do. Okay? So the second circle is the limitation of technical and physical constraints that we were talking about in previous slides. The third circle says what we want to do. Okay? So this circle over here tells us what we can do given our technology available. But even given our technology available, we still have limiting resources. We still have limiting money. So we might not be able to do everything. There are some things that might be feasible, technologically speaking, but they might be just too expensive, or we might not have enough money. No? If we as a country, or we as a society, we as a community, have only a limited amount of resources, then if we have 10 different things where we need to adapt, we need to make a decision where we want to put the money because we don't have the money to do the 10 things, right? And so the, the, the third circle really defines our, the objective of our adaptation plan. In the third circle, we do the analysis of all the things that we need to do. We do the analysis of how much money we have to do all those things. And then we prioritize, right? We say, okay, of all these things, 
I can only do two. So I'm going to have to prioritize, and out of those 10 things, choose the two that will be most effective in reducing harmful effects to my group or my society. Okay? Now, as it says here, uh, <clears throat> the size of the outside circle determined by, uh, is mi determined by mitigation. This is what we already said, no? So this circle can become bigger or smaller depending on our mitigation levels. The space between the first and the last circle represents residual impact. And so this is what we can do. But still, this is just the plan, no? This is adaptation plan that we saw in the morning. This is the prioritizing of the two things that I said we're going to do out of the ten. But then we still have an inner circle that relates to what we will do. So that's the implementation process. No? We were talking about in the morning, not only about doing the plan, but then coming through with the plan, implementing the plan. And so we have all these levels of, of, uh, of adaptation. Uh -huh. And in general, this is really what we're going to do. And so this is what we do, and this is what we needed to do, right? And so we have all this space over here of things that we could have done, but for many reasons we didn't do. And so all of this is what is called residual impact. Thinking that, okay, with the things that we were able to do, adaptation reduced the risk of impact. And so the blue circle is really the only things where we were able to reduce the impact. So anything outside the blue circle represents impact that we were not able to address, either because we didn't have the money, or because we didn't have the technology, or because it was just impossible to do, right? And so all of these are impacts that I cannot control for, okay? So this is a simple diagram, but it's important to, to, to keep in mind. <clears throat> There's always decisions, right? There are always priorities. And there are limits to adaptation, as we discussed. No? There are things that we just cannot do or are not feasible because they are too expensive or they are not priority, in my case. Okay? Any comments or reactions to this? <clears throat> now, the question is, who makes these decisions? Let's say that we have this in specific uh, case of a country. Well, the government makes the decision, supposedly, no? But is the government making the right decision for the wealth of the majority of the people? That's always a question, right? Is the government, is the government really trying to maximize this blue circle? Or is the government only trying to help a smaller group of people who are lobbying stronger for their own benefit? And so another big question that is under, uh, under all this analysis is who makes the decisions, right? If we have limited resources, who makes the decision of what falls within this blue circle, and who makes the decision of what is left out of the blue circle, what is left as residual impact that won't be able to be taken care of. And, and, and that's a difficult uh, question, no? In this residual impacts, we have people here, right? We have ecosystems there, we have animals there, we have plants there that we won't be able to help for any reason. And so, we are making the decision of leaving those impacts out of my own work just because I don't have the resources. So it's an important, an important issue. Ideally, the government or whoever is making the decision is really getting all the feedback and all the information from, from the entire population. So ideally, we would have a more or less democratic way of deciding what goes into the blue circle. In practice, we know that that's extremely difficult, if not impossible. No. It's impossible to really ask everybody what's going to go into the blue circle. I was telling you about the process of um, <clears throat> de defining the adaptation plan in Guatemala and how it has taken us four years. And this is only dealing with the plan at the, at the central government. No, We have only really discussed the plan with people in the capital. We have really not gone uh, that much and talked to people outside of the capital. And so really the plan is not representative. We haven't really asked people in the countryside or in cities outside the capital, are, are, we, are we thinking of the right way? Are we adding the right things to the blue circle? 
or are we leaving something outside the blue circle that should be in there? How do we ask everybody? And Guatemala is a small country. It's a, only 16 million people. When you have 100 million people, when you have a large territory, how do you ask everybody? So it's, it's, uh, it's difficult, no? How do we decide what goes into the blue circle and what is left out of the blue circle? Okay. Um, <clears throat> who is responsible for financing adaptation? Another important question. We know that funding is limited. We know that developing countries, especially small developing countries, have very limited funding. We know that these countries were not responsible for the problem. So we are asking other people to help us in coping with the problem. So the question is then who should pay for that? Who pays for adaptation? And how much should they contribute into the adaptation fund? And what criteria are appropriate for determining this? That's a big political question that is happening right now. And uh, the <coughs> different yearly meetings are trying to answer this. So I already mentioned to you in the Paris Agreement, there is a, a figure of $100 billion uh, per year uh, contributed from the wealthy countries. Well, the question is, how much should each one of them contribute? What, what is the proportion? Should they all contribute the same? Should they, they all contribute uh, proportionally, uh, considering their emissions? But if we consider their emissions, should we consider their emissions right now? Should we consider the historical emissions? Because that's a big difference, no? If we, if we look at the emissions right now, um, the biggest polluter is China. The second polluter is the United States. But if we look at the historical em emissions, then uh, it completely changes. The biggest polluter there then becomes U.S. China is very small polluter, right? Because China started to pollute only about 20 to 30 years ago, whereas the U.S. has been polluting for over 100 years. And so it, it's not a trivial question to ask how do we determine the contribution of the different polluters in terms of paying for the problem. Hmm? China is the other producer, and the United States is the consumer. Uh -huh. So it's more complicated than this. Yeah, and there's one more complication here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, most of the economists are trying to understand the international trade, because China is the producer, and the United States is the consumer. So in our field, we are trying to look at some methodology that you can look for the value chain or for the whole production and see, for example, uh, if China is producing, I don't know, which kind of product and selling to the United States, so who's going to pay for this? Mm -hmm. Yeah. China is the biggest producer in the world, but they don't just they don't produce just because they love to produce. They produce because there are buyers willing to buy their products. And US is their biggest buyer, but we are all buyers, no? I mean all of our computers most likely are made in China, no? So we are using their technology. And so yeah, in a way we are partly responsible for China being so actively producing different goods. So that's the question on the side of polluters. Now the question on the side of the smaller countries receiving the impacts, that's also difficult to answer. Who is eligible for receiving payments from the fund? So we do have adaptation fund in place. Now how, how are we going to distribute the money? What criteria should be used for prioritizing the different countries for allocating these funds? That's a tricky question, no? And actually that question has uh, sparked an interesting race to become uh, the most affected country. So it's kind of a perversive race, no? So now countries are trying to show who is the most vulnerable. So who is being suffering the most, no? And in, in, in countries like Guatemala, for example, you hear politicians often repeating that. Guatemala has been reported as being one of the most vulnerable countries, right? And they repeat that a lot because they know that eventually that's going to mean, okay, if we are one of the most affected countries, then we should be at the top of the list when they distribute the money. So it's a little bit of a perversive uh, situation in which 
we're trying to prove how bad of a situation we have. So the worse we are, the better off we can be in terms of receiving more money. You know? But, but that, that's, a, that's an important question. How do we prioritize who should get more money or who should get first a chunk of the money? Any, any reactions uh, <coughs> there? Thank you. I, I think uh, when we were undergoing through ecosystems analysis, uh, they came up with the concept that uh, let the polluter pay, mm -hmm. so that the, the polluter, uh, because he's responsible for for what he's doing, let him pay to to those ones feeling the impacts. But um, current as things are, the politics of the world, if the leading polluter, one of the leading polluter is getting out of the Paris Agreement. So still the countries which have impacts, which feel the impacts, uh, they remain feeling the impacts, but... Uh, the returns will be really very low. Uh, so my suggestion is if we could, uh, if all of the parties responsible, like China, uh, United States, could continue, sub could get back to that agreement, maybe, maybe something <coughs> can be done. That's what I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so going back to the first question, how do we distribute who pays what? Well, we first have to figure out how to make sure that everybody agrees to pay. You know? If somebody bails out of the agreement, then we are in, in big problem. <coughs> mm -hmm. But going back to the second question, if you can also add comments to that, how do we choose who should receive more money first? Okay. Go ahead. I can hear you here. My point is on, unless we stop discussing on, you know, dividing the two countries, the two most serious polluters, like, you know, China being in part of developing countries is claiming, you know, I should be receiving money from America, being part of the developing economy, and America on the other side considering itself as part of the developed economy, I shouldn't be paying for China, China being the second largest polluter. So unless we stop dividing countries into the so-called economy, economics of economic lines, considering as part of developing economy and developed economy, that problem will never and ever be solved. Mm -hmm. So for me, bringing the two countries into the same table so that they have to take their own share. Mm -hmm. For me, a farm household, a small farm household in Ethiopia, is paying the cost of America and paying the cost of China. So they should be responsible while saying this, those smallholder farmers have their own share to take part in addressing the problem because we live on the same planet. If America is withdrawn from that Paris Agreement, the cost is going to be high for those smallholder farmers in Africa, in various parts of the world, they are going to die. So the most responsible body should be there. They shouldn't withdraw from that part. They are equally responsible. China shouldn't keep on claiming that it's part of a developing nation. It's not about economics. It's about you know being responsible for what they are doing. It. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, th that's an interesting point. Um, the first attempt was to divide countries in two groups: no developing and developed. And so the Kyoto Protocol, which was the first instrument that they came up with right away, like three or four years after signing the Climate Change Agreement, the Kyoto Pro Protocol was simple in saying, well, the polluters were the rich countries, so let the rich countries do something about it, and the poor countries will not have to do something about it. But then dividing the countries in poor and rich, as you mentioned, uh, proved to be tricky, no? And so the Paris Agreement is moving away from that, is not dividing the countries in, in wealthy and, and poor or developing and developed. The Paris Agreement is saying, well, we should all contribute. And the approach of the Paris Agreement was, well, let's all contribute 
in a voluntary basis. You know? that, that's, that's what uh, the approach is now. We should all have nationally determined contributions. You know? and the nationally determined contribution is basically a number that has been determined by every country as their uh, proposed reduction. You know? And so before coming to Paris, every country determined a number of what they were going to do in terms of reducing their pollution. They put together all these numbers, and the analysis shows that it's not enough. You know? if, if all countries uh, come through and do all these reductions that they promise, still the temperature will increase between 3 and 4 degrees. And so the, 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 the promised contribution, <coughs> regardless of whether we are rich or poor, are not enough. And so we still need to come up with better um, contributions. But, but that's important. Um, in the new agreement, we are moving away from dividing the countries in rich and poor, at least in terms of mitigation. In terms of adaptation, there's still a, a big problem of, yes, identifying the poor countries that are receiving most of the impact. Now, that has become extremely tricky also. And one of the <laughs> strongest negotiations that we had among the developing countries was to, to have a language on that. Um, Central America uh, wanted to have a language somewhere in the agreement saying that Central America was recognized as one of the most vulnerable regions in the world. And there is scientific evidence to that. There are several papers that show that Central America will be, res will be very responsive to extreme weather. Uh, there are many numbers that show that, yes, most Central American countries are there at the top ten of uh, most impacted countries by extreme weather events. So Central America wanted to have that language in the, in the Paris Agreement. Immediately we had a response from Africa saying, no way. If you want that language there, we, we have to add the language Africa also being one of the most uh, vulnerable places in the, in the world. When Africa did that, then other countries jumped and said, no way. If you're going to have that, then the next group was the small islands. Small Island said, no, that we are the most vulnerable places in the world. And then we started to get everybody trying to be in that club of uh, most vulnerable places. So at the end, the decision was, no, let's drop that language. So there was no language in terms of who is the most vulnerable in the Paris Agreement. And actually, that was one of the reasons why, <clears throat> or one of the reasons given by Nicaragua when they decided not to support the Paris Agreement. You probably have heard that Nicaragua is one of the few countries in the world that decided not to uh, endorse, not to accept the Paris Agreement. Even in the plenary, when the, when the Paris Agreement was accepted, right away they, uh, they took the floor, they asked for the floor, and said, no, 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 I don't agree with this agreement. Uh, luckily, the, the, the chair of the, of the session had already agreed that everybody agreed, uh, because he did kind of a, a quick uh, voting. So it didn't give the chance for Nicaragua to speak up. But yeah, Nicaragua said at the end, no, 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 I'm not in agreement with this agreement because uh, you left out the language that we were one of the most vulnerable uh, countries. So anyway, um, that's a tricky question. Who is the most vulnerable? And we have seen also that even within a country, right, very wealthy countries can have very vulnerable populations. And very poor countries also have very wealthy people who are not vulnerable at all. And so that also becomes very tricky. Uh, here and there. I think you were first, so what, let's go first there, and then we go here. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, in how do you manage the fact of the corruption? You know, vulnerable countries, vulnerable people, and there's a great opportunity to get some money, you know? And there's always people around that want to get money and don't give to any philanthropic cause, yeah. you know? Yeah. Yeah, well, we can ask the Brazilians, how are you dealing with corruption here? <laughs> um, <laughs> in, in Guatemala, we were, able, we were able to manage to fire our last president on the grounds of corruption, and so he's now <coughs> in jail. Uh, but we thought that that was a big achievement. But now we have a government that is more or less following the same line, so we really didn't make a, a substantial change. We probably sent one president to jail, but we were not able to change the system so that the new government coming in 
would not follow in the same old uh, ways of, uh, of doing politics. So corruption is, is a huge problem. Uh, I have no answer uh, other than providing the population with more tools to um, fiscalizar, to, how do you say that? Anybody who knows English better than I do or who is not as tired as I'm now. Uh, uh, providing with tools uh, for, for population to really uh, follow through with what uh, politicians are doing. No? I think that in that sense we can learn from some developed countries. Uh, uh, in, their, in those countries, uh, democracy works better. It's probably not ideal, but it works better because population has better tools to see what's happening with their, with their government. Um, we were discussing that with uh, my friend from Guatemala, who is here as, a, uh, as one of the participants, uh, we basically need to provide information to people. No? We go back to information. Uh, if we are able to provide uh, people with information and education, uh, then at least we're giving the basic tools for people to realize if a certain politician is doing a right thing or is not doing a, a good job. Uh, it's not probably the ideal solution, but it's definitely the first step, right? Um, but, but again, yeah, uh, corruption is, is, is a huge problem. And um, I don't know, uh, probably there are people here who have better ideas that I can discuss with you right now, being so late in the day. Um, anybody wants to talk about corruption, but you have a question here? Uh, <coughs> my uh, point regarding the question which we are facing is how do you prioritize or how do you allocate mm -hmm. the, the funding? The <coughs> Mm -hmm. very little funding that we have um, uh, for adaptation. It goes somewhat similar in the line of uh, how do you allocate um, uh, the funding for mitigation or how do you uh, allocate the burden of uh, mitigation, uh, burden sharing. Uh, but adaptation is a little more complicated here um, because um, there are far-fetching longer-term impacts of climate change uh, when you talk about mitigation side. But adaptation is something which you face now or already been facing in the past. Uh, so one of the mechanisms that, as far as I uh, have come to know, is uh, the Warsaw International Mechanism on Loss and Damages, which is one way through which uh, the most vulnerable countries are being defined, which is... So the term loss and damages is kind of coined to understand the impact which is irreversible, which is already lost. And uh, those countries, so it is essentially to look back in the past how much each country have been losing um, due to climate change of the past. And based on that, assess or have an idea about who is the most vulnerable or who are the most vulnerable. But then it doesn't stop there. That is not, uh, that is necessary to know, but it is not sufficient because as somebody was pointing out, uh, it is the resource utilization, how efficiently one country who receives the fund how efficiently we t one is utilizing also is important. There are uh, economists have been engaging to understand how far uh, the efficiency of this funding um, uh, utilization has been happening, but there are very clear, uh, very little statistics about it. Uh, but then the idea is the political economic factors, they influence a lot on these grounds. Uh, for example, who is in power? It determines a lot as to how efficiently the resource is going to be utilized. Um, or, for example, there is caste politics, there is uh, religion politics, and so mo uh, so mo so forth. Uh, so it is it is a very challenging um, task, in my view. Uh, but then, at least the starting point, in my view, is uh, the impact assessment literature, which is which at least gives us the direction that who are likely to be vulnerable or in future, given that they have been facing a lot of impacts in the past. Okay, thank you. Thank you. This is important. Um, the concept of loss and damage is a, is a fairly recent concept that has been added to the discussion. It was added in, in, in uh, uh, Warsaw. That was like four years ago. Uh, and basically, like you were saying, that's a way to try to account for the impacts of climate change. Now, another uh, anecdote I was telling you about why Nicaragua uh, rejected the Paris Agreement. Just before approving the Paris Agreement, in the final session over there in Paris, uh, we were ready to, to say yes or no, and then they had to stop the session because two countries were saying no. One country was Nicaragua, saying no because of this, tell you, that I told you already, that uh, the language was left out in terms of being more vulnerable. 
The other country was the United States, right? In the last minute, they were ready to bail out of the agreement. And the reason was lost and damaged, no? There was some language there in lost and damaged section of the Paris Agreement that was uh, referring to the possibility of developing countries suing developed countries for the amount of money that they had lost in terms of climate, climate change. And so this possibility of uh, one country suing another country, uh, United States said, no way, I cannot accept the agreement with that language. And so they stopped the whole session and they went back to negotiation right there on the floor. All uh, European countries surrounding the United States trying to convince the United States, all Central American countries trying co to convince Nicaragua. We were not able to convince Nicaragua. European countries were not able to convince the United States. They basically dropped that language. No, they basically dropped the phrase saying uh, that we had the capability of suing other countries. And with that, the United States agreed to, uh, to the Paris Agreement. Uh, now we know that they are trying to uh, come out of the agreement. Um, it's not that easy to come out of the agreement. No, they, they have some, um, some steps that they need to follow, uh, including waiting some years before they can drop out of the agreement. And that, that waiting period was put there so that there is a change of government. There is a, an option to change the government. So if the government in the United States changes, they might change the idea of dropping out of a Paris Agreement. So we, we still have to wait for, for that to happen. Uh, so it is an uncertain situation right now. No, uh, It was difficult to come up with an agreement, with the Paris Agreement. Um, it took not, not many days in Paris. It took many years. No. The Paris Agreement really started uh, like four years before. The idea of the Paris Agreement started four years before, so it took about four years of negotiating. And that's why most countries are now very upset with uh, one country trying to leave the agreement after four years of negotiation. But uh, let's hope for the best. Let's hope that the agreement holds. And, and more importantly, uh, let's hope that the agreement works, right? How do we implement the agreement? How do we make it work? Uh, how do we make sure that uh, countries are going to uh, reduce pollution? You know? Are we going to be able to uh, move away from oil? Hmm? We have based our economic growth in the last 100 years on oil, so we have become addicted to oil. And people who have addictions can tell us that it's very difficult to give up addictions. You know? And so our addiction to oil is going to be tricky, but it, 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 at least in theory, it's doable. So let's, uh, the agreement says that, yes, we should do it. Before the end of the century, we should be oil-free. But we'll see. We, we'll still have to see if that comes to, to a reality. Uh, anybody else on corruption? Because that was the topic we left out in the air. Mm -hmm. and Mine is on corruption. Uh huh. Uh, I wanted to ask you, at the same time, comment. Uh -huh. uh, is it true that the most corrupt countries are the most vulnerable? If so, because most of the vulnerable countries, surely, most of the so-called corrupt countries adopted the Paris Agreement. Uh -huh. Now to the framers uh -huh. of the agreement. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know <laughs> what is going to be done uh -huh. to monitor the implementation of the agreement. Uh -huh. Because uh -huh. the role they are supposed to play sometimes is conflicted with corruption. So now there is a contradiction. The most corrupt signed very fast. Very fast, without <laughs> even revising uh -huh. <laughs> the implications of the agreement. Uh -huh. But now, countries like those ones who hesitated to sign very fast, they were talking about their economy, others are talking about the losses and damage. But the most corrupt countries signed the agreement, and you said that some of them are vulnerable. To, to whatever. So, uh, me, I'm wondering how monitoring surely will make sense to bring out the aims and objectives of the agreement. An interesting research question, if anybody wants to take that for their PhD, no? The link between...
question and vulnerability. I, I haven't seen much literature on that, but that would be interesting to, to analyze. I know that there are some indices uh, worldwide in terms of transparency, so it shouldn't be that hard to, to do correlations there. But in general, determining who is the most vulnerable is still a tricky question. And, and uh, interestingly, IPCC doesn't want to go into, into that question. If you look at the IPCC report, nowhere you're going to find any indication of who is more vulnerable. They do talk about vulnerable populations, vulnerable groups, but they never, ever deal with who is most vulnerable in terms of countries. And so that, that, um, that's, um, they, they, they move away from that because they have the mandate of not being policy uh, prescriptive, as I told you in the morning. No? So just saying X country the most vulnerable, that would be already policy prescriptive. And so the IPCC will never go into that. But that's, a, that's an important question that is related to that second question. No? Who is going to be receiving the money first, or who is going to be receiving more money? Um, so that's still left up for discussion. Oh, and there's one more question here at the end. It's hard to see, but who makes the decision? No? Who makes that decision? Or like you were saying, who, who, who is going to oversee the whole process to make sure that it's transparent? The Paris Agreement does have a whole section on, on transparency, uh, but that's complicated, no? If we, if we uh, see corruption at the national level, most likely we're going to see corruption at the global level, and we're going to see some uh, not-so-clean business uh, going on also at the global level. So corruption, again, uh, a, a difficult situation. I have no answer for you, but just some ideas. Um, so if nobody else wants to comment on corruption, let's try to finish this presentation. Anybody else on corruption? Uh, I think we have only a couple of more um, uh, slides here. <clears throat> so defining the cost and benefits of adaptation project uh, raises some conceptual issues. No? So if we want to cost a project on adaptation, if we want to add monetary value to a project adaptation, it gives us some problems. Uh, many actions have an influence on the impact of climate change without being adaptation projects per se, right? And so countries have started to do things, and not necessarily they are doing them just because of climate change, right? And so if we have an activity, like, for example, increasing construction uh, regulations, that might be done in part because of climate change, but that's also done because we want safer buildings. And so how do we separate one from the other? That becomes tricky. On the other hand, many adaptation projects have consequences beyond a reduction in climate change impacts or an increase in welfare from exploiting opportunities. In other words, I might do something to adapt to climate change, but the benefit from that project will not only fall within the climate change area, but will also have other areas of impact. And so basically what we have is if we want to um, define the cost of adaptation, we would need to be able to separate what we did in the past and how much of that was done because of climate change and how much was done not because of climate change. And we also would have to separate the effects of the initiative and try to separate how much is really related to climate change, but how much of those effects really fall outside the area of climate change. So one idea presented in the IPCC report is that Similar to mitigation, we basically need to define a baseline, and we need to define additionality. I don't know if you're familiar with those two terms. Those are very common terms used in carbon sequestration, no? When we want to analyze if we are able to sequester carbon from the atmosphere, we produce a baseline of deforestation, for example, and then on top of that baseline, we do what we call the additionality analysis. So if there is any carbon sequestration, in addition to the baseline. So the idea is that a similar concept should be applied to adaptation. So we should have a baseline in which, in which we show the historical activities that the country or the, or, or the specific group did. And out of that baseline, we would to separate what was done because of climate change and what was not done because of climate change. 
And then on top of that baseline, we should be able to try to figure out the additional benefits that we receive from new initiatives based on climate change. So just a, a general idea, but it just shows that it's tricky, you know? It's tricky, again, going back to the same question that we did, we had earlier. If countries are going to, are supposed to pay for adaptation, what is a valid adaptation project, you know? If I have a project on improving our, my buildings, or if I have a project on reducing poverty, is that really climate change related or is that just development? You know? Are we paying for adaptation or are we paying for development? Perhaps we are paying for both. If we are paying for both, how do we separate? Do we need to separate? So those are just questions that are still uh, unresolved but that need uh, an answer. And that's why we need more <coughs> uh, economic theory to be developed around this area. In terms of the cost of adaptation, uh, this is also a graph from chapter 17 on the economics of adaptation. And this shows uh, in red estimates by United Nations and in blue estimates by the World Bank on how much uh, money is needed by developing countries only. This is only developing countries uh, to adapt to climate change. Okay? And, and this analysis is divided by sectors, infrastructure, coastal, water, agriculture, health, extreme weather events. And so the World Bank did this analysis together with uh, the Climate Change Convention. And the World Bank added all up these numbers. And they com came up with a range of 70 to $100 billion per year by year 2050. Uh, so this is how much they estimate that adaptation is going to cost in developing countries. And this is, mm, the, uh, this is the analysis where they came up with the $100 billion per year in the Paris Agreement. Okay? So there is, just, there is some uh, numerical uh, basis for this amount of $100 billion. But of course, this analysis is uh, highly, um, uh, well, you, I mean, you could question the analysis, or you could you could see that there is a lot of uncertainty in a, in, a, in a lot of these estimates, no? And so, how much are we gonna need for adaptation? A hundred billion was the best guess that the World Bank could com come up with. So that's the figure that they use in the Paris Agreement, but that's still something that needs to be improved and something that needs to be updated, because certainly this is probably the cost uh, under current situations. But then we need to update the situation every five or 10 years, depending on <clears throat> how the climate is evolving in the future. Adaptation and mitigation, this is something we have discussed also, also during the day. Adaptation and mitigation funding require coordination because they can be uh, competing against each other. They, they can be competing for scarce resources. Uh, but they also compete with the consumption and non-climate investment. And so, for example, if we want to use a piece of land to, um, to do some adaptation, so that piece of land then probably should be kept with a natural vegetation. That will be ecosystem-based adaptation, no? So we might want to leave that piece of land with the, with the, with the original forest cover to protect us against something, no? For example, uh, mangrove forest in the coastal areas. So that would be the adaptation goal. The mitigation goal might be, well, we need that land <coughs> to plant a new forest because a, a growing forest will be absorbing carbon from the atmosphere. So the two might be competing or the two might be complementing. If the land is not forested and I plant forest, we said already, no? That would be adaptation and mitigation at the same time. And both of those uses will be competing with another use, food production, no? So we might end up deciding, well, no, we don't want the forest. No, we don't want to plant a new forest. We want to plant uh, crops there because we need to eat. You know? And we saw early in the day that the climate change agreement was very clear in saying we need to control the concentrations of uh, greenhouse gases in the atmosphere without any effects on food production. That was, that was left there very clearly. right? And so food production is something um, it's always there um, as one of the limitations of what we can do. When, whenever we start to discuss things that will affect food production, then 
the discussion slows down. No, we cannot talk about uh, decreasing food production because we need to continue with food security. Adaptation and mitigation initiatives, for example, need to use land. That's what we are saying, no? And that competes with food production. Nevertheless, consider, considering both adaptation and mitigation widens the set of actions and lowers the total cost of climate change. And so if we are able to come up with ideas that do both, then we, of course, become more efficient in using the limiting resources. Finally, adaptation and development. We all have also discussed about this, but this is just to uh, put it in the economic context. We know that there is a relationship between adaptation and socioeconomic development, particularly in lower income countries. And these are actually uh, statements taken out of the IPCC report. So this is not something that I'm telling you. This is something that the 200 and so scientists in the IPCC concluded that was relevant to tell to policymakers. In terms of uh, complementary between the two, studies show that both development and adaptation can be enhanced via a climate resilient way of development. And so if we are able to promote a development that also increases climate resilience, then we are achieving both of them. Okay? So uh, it is possible to, do, to try to do both, to try to put money to develop the countries and by developing the population of the country to increase the resilience of that population to climate change. Development in general can increase adaptive capacity through enhancement in human and other capital. This is something you discussed uh, extensively yesterday with, um, uh, with Maria Carmen. And uh, so basically, if we increase the level of development in a population, we are also increasing the adaptive capacity of that population. So if we put money in one area, that money can serve in two purposes. Thus, developing goals can be generally consistent with adaptation goals. And that was also something that was brought up in the morning. United Nations is now promoting the development goals as the goals for all countries to pursue for year 2030. You know? And so if, we, if, if all the countries are able to come through with these goals in year 2030, then by improving the development uh, um, goals of the, uh, of the different regions, we would also be improving the resilience to climate change in those regions. And so, at least in theory, those two uh, goals are adapted, are, are um, lined up in the same direction. No? Uh, if we increase the development of a country, we should also increase the resilience of that country to climate change. So finally, uh, a few uh, closing ideas here of things that we have been discussing during the day. The first step for adaptation to future climate is reducing the current vulnerability to extreme climate events. You know? And so this is an important idea. Climate change happens in the future. Climate change really won't be more visible until year 2050 and on. So right now, it is difficult to separate climate change from climate variability. That was a question we had early on. Uh, we could only talk probably about climate variability right now. But if we are able to adapt to the current variability, then most likely we'd be, we would be in a good uh, path to adapting to future variability. So even if we are not able to convince our policymakers about doing something for the future, we can certainly try to convince them to do something for the present. And in that sense, the present is already variable enough with more variability than, than normal that uh, the present is already requiring uh, many adaptation measures. Long-term planning and the related human and financial resources need, the, the, financial, the financial resource needs may be seen as conflicting with present social deficit in the welfare of the population in developing countries. But no action now would result in higher costs in the future. In other words, we can, again, a, politi a politician can come back to us and say, well, you're asking me to invest money to solve a problem 50 years in the future. 
but the current problems demand some of that funding. So let me focus first on the current uh, um, needs of the country before I focus on the future needs of the country. The problem is that no action now would make it more expensive to do something in the future. Now, <clears throat> if we accept this statement that no action now would be more expensive in the future, still some people argue, OK, let's, let's, let's say that that's true. But let's continue to uh, promote rapid development, especially in the poor sectors. Let's try to make them richer as fast as possible so that when the future comes, they have more resources to confront that more expensive future. So that still leaves some room to argument in saying, well, even if it is more expensive in the future, let's, let's postpone it to the future. Let's still focus on the present. Let's continue growing, even if we pollute more, hoping that by, that, by growing more now, we will have enough resources in the future so that we can pay the future cost of adaptation. Whether that's true or not, we will have to wait 30 years to see what happens in the future. There are, there are a few experiences on synergies between development and adaptation and mitigation planning. And so those examples can be used uh, for local communities and government to design strategies to reduce vulnerability and to develop adaptation measures. And so uh, even though adaptation is a relatively new uh, activity, related to climate change, at least newer than mitigation, we are already starting to see a few experiences where we see successful adaptation happening. And so we have already some learning experiences where we can uh, uh, gather information on how to improve our adaptation processes locally. Facing a new climate system, and in particular, the increase of extreme events will call for new ways to manage human and natural systems for achieving sustainable development. And so <clears throat> basically, to face climate change, we will need really a new vision on how to face development. And basically, that development uh, should uh, be more in the line of focusing on the people who are being left behind. So ideally, if we want to really reduce the vulnerability of population, we not only need to think about developing in general, but we need to think about inclusive development, meaning not only making the society richer as a whole, but making sure that that wealth that we are producing, that well-being that we are producing, is really reaching out uh, to the different groups. Because so far, what we are seeing is that, yes, in general, the well-being of the world, the, the, the wealth of the uh, world is increasing, but we are leaving behind still a considerable number of people. And so that's um, unacceptable in terms of adaptation to climate change. And I believe, amazingly enough, that we finish with the presentation. <laughs> and I still have some more. <laughs> so, we we, we, we broke a record of six hours of continuing teaching. We should write to Guinness <laughs> and see if that's a new record. At least it's a record for me, as I was telling you in the morning. But it was a, a great pleasure to, to share with you. And you were definitely a very uh, easy um, group of uh, students and audience to, to, to talk to. Uh, very interested, very interesting ideas on your work. Uh, my email is there. So if you have any questions or any follow-up ideas, write to me. Uh, my main limitation is time. So I might not be able to answer to you right away. But if you if you get an answer, then write again. Uh, <laughs> but uh, sooner or later, I, 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 write back, I, I will write, uh, write back to you. Um, so yeah, many of you have many interesting projects. Uh, I'm sure all of you have interesting projects. But the ones I was able to talk to during the break, indicate me that you are doing all very interesting work. So it'll be great to collaborate. I think one of the best uh, assets in this kind of uh, interaction is the, the linkages that we uh, make with other uh, researchers. 
So I really encourage you to continue collaboration and communication among you. And if I can be of any help, uh, also communication with me. And just, again, uh, have some patience if I don't respond right away. But uh, thank you again, and um, wish you good luck in all your work. Thanks, Professor. Um, I have a question about long-term planning. Um, how do you think about how to address long-term planning um, in our countries? Um, because in, in most of countries, uh, when the government change, the plans change. And this is the, the main problem we have. Yeah. yeah, we have that problem in our countries also. Um, Changing of government uh, changes uh, policies. And now we know that that happens everywhere, even in the biggest countries with the most stable governments. Um, and that's not unique to the United States. Uh, there's a story of Canada doing the same situation. No? Canada, for some time, was not participating in the climate change negotiations because the government they had was adverse to the concept of climate change. And then they changed government a few years ago, and now they are back in the negotiation. Australia, the same situation. And so it happens everywhere, no? We change government and we change policies. Uh, so that's a challenge. And, and the challenge is not only in terms of uh, changing uh, the overall policies of the government. Um, the challenge is also, in, in our countries at least, every time we change government, uh, a lot of uh, the high-level and middle-level officers change. And so oftentimes we have to start from zero uh, in terms of uh, dealing with, with, with new government officials. Uh, it, it's tough. It, it's, it's hard to do. Uh, I've been dealing with uh, climate change in Guatemala for 20 years, so I, I've known a lot of uh, government officials. And there is no other option but to make friends with the new officers when, when they come to office. Sometimes it's harder, sometimes it's more difficult, but in academia, we have that um, advantage. You know? We have more of a stability, so I think that's an important role of academia, of universities. Um, we tend to stay in the same position for many years. I've been in my position for 20 years. You've been also 20-something years in your position. And so professors uh, tend to stay put in the same place for a long time, and so we can have that responsibility of trying to continue um, the processes. And uh, it's interesting that, at least in Guatemala, society is recognizing that. And so oftentimes now the general society is asking for academia to participate, not only in climate change but in other issues, because they've seen the value of having people who remain in their, in their own thinking and, and line of work, even through the change of government. Uh, but th that's definitely a, a big challenge to to plan in the long term when we have governments that only work in the short term and, with, and governments that change a lot. The only other uh, uh, hope that I can give you in that line is that <clears throat> a lot of the activities and actions on climate change are now being taken up by the private sector away from the government. And so even in, in the U.S., for example, uh, I was talking to some uh, officials from the U.S. government, and they were saying that. They were saying, even in, if our head changed, and even if our head is now given a different direction, uh, the local governments are remaining more or less in the same lines. And uh, the private sector is already starting a process, and they are not going to change their goals uh, drastically, even if the government changes. And so that's, I think, an, uh, 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 an important point and uh, a good point for hope, no? that um, the private sector is seeing this uh, as a definite problem to their future productivity, right? They are not, I don't know if they are there because um, they care for the environment, but regardless of whether they care or not for the environment, they care about their productivity, and they see this as a threat to their productivity. And so a lot of the private sector is investing and is already planning for adaptation, and it's already doing uh, things very specifically uh, to plan in the long term. And, and many investments in the private sector have to plan in the long term because that's their business, no? A hydropower plant, for example, they must plan 
for at least 50 years, if not 100 years, right? No, normally, a hydropower plant is built for 50 years, no? Uh, and so they have to take into account climate change. There, there's no other way. And so private sector uh, does have a very strong role in making sure that many of these uh, policies and many of these actions follow through in the long term in spite of uh, gov specific governments changing. So, mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, <clears throat> okay, yeah, we have some more minutes. We can continue. Uh, there's a microphone coming. But you were going to show something? No, 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 you can. We have a few more minutes. Okay, yeah. Just to give a note to the participants, I'm going to share the experience of Ethiopia. Uh, I was discussing, I was uh, a bit, you know, curious about the affected and affecting countries. So the case in point in Ethiopia is, you know, Ethiopia being the least contributor to the greenhouse gas has taken the initiative to blend the so-called adaptive and, you know, mitigation approach which we developed a project, uh, national level strategy, climate resilient green economy, that tries to consider the adaptation component at all sectors, in all regional levels, while working for the mitigation component. And that project, that strategy has, you know, brought number of international organizations to support the capacity of the country, so that we are working on, you know, both the adaptive cap adaptation and at the same time working on the mitigation component. So my concern here is national level governments have to take the initiative to try to blend both the adaptation and that of the mitigation component so that, you know, the divided line between a you know, developing country and developed country can come to the same table so that, you know, we can see better tomorrow while you can consider, you know, both the adaptation and the mitigation component. Just to have a note. Thank you. Just a small question. Uh, IPC, IPCC report were reviewed by government official and or policymaker of respective country. Yeah. So was there any chance of bias? So what's your opinion about that? Uh -huh. Yeah, so um, government officials are requested to review the report in the last stage. You know? So before, even before going to final approval, line by line of the synthesis report, the whole uh, report goes out to review by government officials. Uh, experience shows that most governments don't respond to that request, especially small countries. You know? Governments don't have the capability or the interest to read all this uh, information. And so most reviews are usually received from larger countries, you know? uh, Europe, Europe, and North America. Um, but countries like China, um, Brazil, uh, Argentina are also very active and they do provide uh, a lot of feedback. So uh, governments do have the option of uh, providing feedback to the report before it's published or sent to approval. Now, <clears throat> governments uh, as reviewers uh, have the option of questioning something, but they don't have the option of deleting something. So a government can say, well, you say here that this and this and this, but I don't agree with that. Mm -hmm. So the author has the um, obligation to read that and to uh, respond to the reviewer. So the, the review, uh, if the reviewer says, no, I don't agree with that, please delete that sentence, the author can respond saying, no, there is some evidence and here are the articles, so I'm going to keep that sentence. So the author has the chance of deciding deciding whether uh, drop or not um, the, the, <clears throat> the, the, the review part. Uh, but, but, yeah, definitely uh, large uh, countries that have a big state, mm -hmm. a stake into the problem, do pay a lot of attention to detail. For example, uh, in, in our chapter, we had a graph in which we imply that China was responsible uh, bigger than other countries for something. I don't remember exactly the details. 
and the, the Chinese government responded, no, that's not true, there's no evidence to that, so please delete that line. And we have no really strong evidence to support it, so we had to delete the line. But so in that case, the review was valid because, yes, we, we believe that that was true, but really when we came to, to the literature, we saw that really we have no strong support for that statement. And so in that sense, uh, the review worked. Uh, and yes, there, there is some, some chances there of biasing the report, but, um, but still uh, authors keep uh, the ownership of the document. So it's really responsibility of the authors to make sure that the text is balanced. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, so we're going to go to some instructions on what's going to happen tomorrow in the field trip. Unfortunately, I won't be able to go with you in the field trip, but I will be tonight having dinner at the hotel, so I hope to have more time to share with uh, some of you during dinner time. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Good applause for the Professor Adrian. Thank you very much, Professor.